You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That's Gratitude Guy, your host, where every week my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google and anywhere else that you get your podcasts. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what I hear or like what you hear rather. That's always appreciated. Uh, And as a quick note, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com. You can also see in the background thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. And I'm available by email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com. So let me get on with the show and introduce my guest. My guest this week is Ashley DePaulis. Ashley DePaulis is an embodied success expert with a background in kinesiology, integrative physiology, and behavioral health. She combines the science of health and performance with the wisdom of the body to help shift you from states of burnout and chronic stress into a spirit of vitality. Always a good thing. Ashley brings body awareness into business through supporting leaders and people-centered organizations in solving the stress, disengagement, and declining return on investment of professionals in the hybrid workplace. Ashley, welcome to the podcast. David, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today and have this conversation. Me too. Me too. So back me up a little bit. We're going to talk about some of your work that you do, Mm -hmm. but I want to go backwards a little bit and just sort of start not necessarily in the the high school, junior high, growing up type of thing, but maybe more around the college age and kind of what started you down this path in terms of schooling and the work that you decided to do for your life. Mm Mm-hmm. So I want to start with one thing as a child and jump to college. So in third grade, I, there was a girl in my class who was being made fun of for her appearance. She was a little bigger and going through puberty before the rest of us and people were picking on her. And I had this bright idea that if I went home with her after school and we played which to me was holding a stopwatch and having her run up and down the stairs and doing other physical activities that, you know, that would change her life and people would, um, you know, not make fun of her anymore. Well, I did that. I went home with her after school. She never invited me over again, but that was the start of my (laughs) career in fitness and movement and training people. So and you were when, in third grade then, Ashley? Yeah. yeah. So you, you were like eight or something, eight or nine, something like that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I, I always, anytime I talk to people, and you might have found this too, there's usually this inkling of, you know, an interest that we expressed in our younger years that yeah. carries through. Yeah. So by the time I got to college, I, I had a car accident. So I was in a really bad car accident when I was 19 years old. And this was between getting out of high school. I graduated a little early because my birthday is on the early end because I'm a summer baby. But I was in a car accident at 19 where I broke my back and all kinds of other bones. Mm. And from that experience, I knew that I wanted to help people. I wanted to be in the health and fitness exercise science space. And that's in college what I focused on. And then from there, it unfolded into landing myself in Colorado, working in a cardiovascular integrative physiology lab, and learning so much more about the body and all sorts of things. 
That is really cool. You know, we had had a previous discussion and you'd mentioned the car accident. And I think you said you actually had another one too, if I'm not mistaken, but this was when you were 19. Mm -hmm. And I meant to ask it at the time because I, I referred to, I think I'm going to get a sh uh, some sort of varnished piece of wood to keep handy. So when I say something like this, I can knock on a nice piece of wood so I don't go get in a car accident. But I've, I've never been in a car accident. And here you have, and I think again, I think you said another one later, but for sure, this is the one at 19. What I would be really curious about is you've had broken back and various other bones. But what's, what's the journey for your brain through that? The bones can get in a cast and they can heal and things like this. But again, the trauma of going through, I don't know how much you remember, but the actual, from the time it happened to, as you healed and went through that, what's that journey like with your mind through that whole sequence? That's a wonderful question. So you're completely right that when we're injured physically, our body has a restoration process that's fairly quick, like our he tissues heal in three weeks, our bones heal in, you know, depending on the break, however amount of time that takes, but it is the mental and emotional aspect that can stick around for years longer. So in my personal experience, I, the car accident I was in was really, really bad because it was on the interstate. We were going 70 plus miles an hour. It was with a drunk driver, you know, like everything that could possibly go wrong, went wrong. And I didn't know for about 14 years that I had PTSD. And so my experience during that time mentally was that it, in, it was in waves because trauma can be triggered and then you, your nervous system can move out of that trigger fairly easily. But with PTSD and chronic stress, it can be harder to make those shifts. So what I mean by shifts are moving from your sympathetic or fight or flight, as people have probably heard before, into your parasympathetic rest and digest. So it, you can get stuck. Your nervous system can get stuck in overdrive. And that's where we find that people are you know, in constant overwhelm. They Being busy feels good to them versus sitting. Um, that feels quite uncomfortable or the opposite of that is more of the depressed states um, where you can't kind of get up that energy level of, you know, feeling good. So we can get stuck in either one of those where I found myself most often stuck was in the overdrive. And I would have these constant hamster wheel thoughts like it would just keep going and never end. And I remember a friend pointed out to me one time, he just said, you know, it seems like you want me to react a certain way to whatever you're experiencing. And that was an aha moment to me where I could actually hear what he was saying versus reacting to it. Because a lot of times in that state, we're very reactionary um, and, you know, end up feeling hurt all the time about what's going on in our experience. So I would say the hamster wheel thinking to answer your question, like very precisely is what my experience was and always kind of, you know, stress would show up in my gut feeling upset or nervous. Um, you know, and there was just a few other things too, but those were the main and ones. You know, I, I came to learn, like a lot of people, I used to associate PTSD or PTS just with the, with the military, because you think of from war and stuff, and then, but then you realize it goes much further, for instance, into an accident like yours and situations. But one thing I don't know is, I know, I know about it, and I know how it can come about and some of those things, but what are some of the treatments that, how did people, I'm assuming that it's, it's, there's some obviously talk therapy and things like this, but what are some of the modalities that help people deal with it or process it? Mm -hmm. So talk therapy is the one that we often hear about because, you know, it's what insurance pays for. Mm. I'll say that, or for a certain extent, it'll pay for that. And trauma lives in the body. A lot of times focusing on healing trauma, if we know that we have it, 
you need to go through the body. So talk therapy isn't something that's going to help long-term with that. That's not to say a talk therapist doesn't have the tools if they've studied it to help um, release trauma from the body. There are so many different ways to do this. Movement is a great one. Mindful movement. So not just pushing yourself in the gym to extremes, but mindful movement, energetic work. So that could be one that I, that worked really well for me is called network spinal analysis, which is a form of chiropractic work, Mm. but it works on an energetic level. So it's not cracking the body, which is also energetic, but it's using certain touch points. So people have probably heard with tapping or certain meridian lines of the body, it works with that energy um, and the breath. So there are a lot of different ways. And the thing that I would say for anyone listening, if they know they're in chronic stress or they had a traumatic event, uh, that finding what works for you is the important thing. So I there's something that could work for me really well that's not gonna be something somebody else resonates with. Mm-hmm. So there's not just one form of treatment. A lot of people now are using, and I have not done this, they're using psychedelics because um, mm. that's a new form of treatment for people. So there are a lot of new things coming out. And mindful movement, what's, what's some examples of that? So what I teach is the easiest way to say it without using big words is noticing the sensations that come up in your body when you feel a wave of stress come up. So that may be noticing your heart rate is a good one. Um, stress arises, you notice your heart beating, you are in complete control of that. A lot of times we think we're not, but we are, and we control, we can control our heart rate through our breath. We can control our heart rate, heart rate through small movements. So I can't put my hands down at my side right now, but you can shake off that stress hands at your side to shake it off. Uh, you can change your perspective, your mindset, your thoughts. So your, your psychology, your thoughts, your physiology, these sensations that arise in your body are in a feedback loop. So it doesn't matter which direction you tackle it. But when you notice, I think a lot of times what's easier for people to notice is their thoughts. And so when you notice your thoughts are going places where you want to have more direction over them, that even just taking your eyesight and changing it from, okay, I'm sitting at my computer, narrow focus to looking up and noticing what's around you. I like to say, notice what you're noticing, then that can change what you're experiencing internally in the body, that heart rate or rapid breathing or stressed feelings. That's really cool. I, I was thinking, and as you were saying that, like, notice your thoughts, but control your heart rate with your breath as an example. And I'm kind of a fanatic about taking care of myself. So I have a Fitbit, I have a whoop band and I have an aura ring. And so I have three different things that I check all throughout the day and so forth. But I've, it's interesting about the breath, because when you meditate, you're sitting there in a chair and, and you've got your arms and your hands kind of like this and so forth. And I listen to a guided meditation and I'll get halfway through it. It's like 15 or 20 minutes. And I'll just sort of casually turn my wrist and look at my Fitbit and the heart rate's down to like 58 or something like this and something really healthy and it's very calm. And, and uh, conversely, there was a, um, I was doing a talk in Nebraska. It was one of the first ones back and in person again this past uh, August mm-hmm. and some small town in Nebraska at a convention center. And so I was getting ready to go on stage for the first time in a year and a half. And my heart beats usually 68, 70, something like this. And and now please welcome David George Brooke, that gratitude. I'm sitting to the side of stage and I just happened to look and it says 127. <laughs> I thought, wow, I guess it's been a while since I've been on stage. The little heart is just mm-hmm. pounding away, but it is amazing how much that we can control that stuff with too and, and control it with the breath. And then really, and, and one of the aspects about that, and I'm assuming it's around your work too, but it's just breathing exercises, correct? 
Mm -hmm. You can, yes, there's tons of different breathing exercises that can help shift your state of being from a nervous anxious state to a more restful state. And, you know, I'm not a breath work practitioner, but I get people to notice their breath and use different breathing techniques to help them. But I think the biggest thing for people is just noticing where they are allowing breath in their body and where they're restricting it. And a lot of times that is through our sit bones. So your sit bones are at the bottom of your glutes. It's your low back. It's your side body. It's your belly. Cause we're up here all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's like, how can we bring the breath into the body? That's why I don't always focus on a specific breathing technique. It's like, how can I just bring the breath into the body mm-hmm. a little bit more? Interesting. So sliding into your work a little bit, I don't know if I would say the typical patient client uh, person that you deal with, but talk a little bit about somebody, you know, obviously say a name, but somebody you can think of that's an example of maybe the journey they were on and how you helped them and what you did and how that kind of worked. Because I think that would be a great interest to our listeners to just get a better idea of kind of what you do. Mm -hmm. Yes. So as an embodiment coach, I, I do get people more present, more aware of their body. Uh, So they're not constantly in their head. You know, that's typically my people are overworking. Uh, I've worked with clients who are overtraining. So athletes who are overtraining, they're feeling overwhelmed. Usually that's showing up as pain or disease in the body in some sort of way. And what I really shift them into, it's more of the state of playfulness and rest and giving ourselves more space and more grace. You know, we talked a lot about spaciousness uh, in a previous conversation of ours, but more space and grace to be themselves versus, you know, piling that pressure on. I think that's the biggest thing, you know, especially with overworking, it's that constant pressure that we're under to perform, but to be high performers and to sustain that performance, we need to take care of ourselves at just as high of a level. And people, the people I work with typically forget that. Like they might know it, but they're not practice. They're not integrating it. They're not practicing it. Or if they are practicing it, they can go deeper with it or they need new tools because the tools that they, that worked for them in the past mm-hmm. aren't working for them now. And I think that, um, overstressed, overworking, overtraining, and I almost think like overtraining, you think, well, if somebody's training and to get in good shape, it's like the old, uh, what was it? Uh, not dichotomy, but that, um, oxymoron military intelligence. It'd be like, how can you overtrain? Cause if you're training, that means you're, you're getting in shape and things, but mm-hmm. how do you help those individuals to find the balance? Cause I would think, you know, it's, it's so, at least in my opinion, it's so hard to find people that are motivated. A lot of my life has been managing very large companies, uh, retail companies like Lowe's and Nordstrom. So you had all these different people. So you had a wide assortment from very motivated to not motivated at all. Mm-hmm. And it was my experience, although a bit negative, that the vast majority of people weren't very motivated. So if you get somebody that's that's overtraining, and that's the thing, like, wow, wouldn't that be the ultimate? But that's that extreme is no good either. So how do you help to have those people find a balance? Mm, I have to make it simple and fun <laughs> mm-hmm. is how I do that. Uh, and that shows up as knowing, and you'll relate with this since you're a speaker, is the story that we're telling ourselves. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. always a story that is running the show. It's running our mind. It's running our behaviors and the behaviors of overdoing are what need a little bit of course correction. So it's, how does that story show up? Is that story actually your voice or is it a voice of a parent? Is it a voice of a previous boss? Is it a voice of your teammates? You know, where it, it's finding your, your footing within all those competing aspects of self 
of your experience. So it's how that story is showing up, where that story, so our patterns, our behavior patterns and these patterns that we speak of that, you know, how do we find more balance with them? They're showing up in our body. Mm. They typically show up in our joints. Uh, they show up in our organs, even though that's a little harder to decipher. Uh, so where are they showing up in the body? A lot of times for clients of mine, it would show up in their low back. It would show up on their hip. It would show up in their ankle. It'd show up in their neck. And it's sometimes on one side of the body or it moves around the body. So it's connecting that story with the pattern of the body. And then when it gets really loud, instead of cranking on it, <laughs> which is what a lot of people want to do. And by cranking on it, I mean, that can show up as, oh, I got to stretch this, or I have to apply um, some sort of healing modality to it. It's like, no, ask, <laughs> ask the question, be curious, be an observer of, okay, what's happening? It's the notice what you're noticing. What's happening in my experience that's making this get louder? And, and it's a form of body talk, some call it. Mm -hmm. and, and you had expressed interest in that um, for yourself and for your clients of what is the body actually saying to us? And that's the wisdom piece that then somebody can take to make a shift. Right. Uh, and usually it's something so simple, like I need to feed myself. I haven't had water today, or I'm looking at a computer screen all day. I need to get up and move around. It's those simple things that we need to bring back in. And from there, it's connecting people back to what actually brings them alive. Like they're usually not participating in activities that make them feel joyful. Mm -hmm. They might just be working or training all the time, but it's like, what else do I enjoy to do? Like, there's so much more to me. So it's bringing that in. Right. And, you know, I think it's, it's interesting how we show up in the stories we tell each other or tell ourselves rather. And then our body is such a reflection of some of the negative inputs and the positive inputs. But one of the ones that this is personal, and I don't know how many listeners, viewers would relate to this probably a lot, I would think. But one of the biggest frustrations I've had is considering the fact I take extremely good care of myself is I just don't understand this concept of going to bed at a reasonable hour. You've been drinking a lot of water, done all the things that the healthy things throughout the day, good food and rest and all that kind of thing. You have a nice mattress that's comfortable to sleep on. So it's not something cheap. You're warm enough or cold enough, whatever temperature you need. You get the eight or nine hours of sleep and you wake up and you're like so stiff. And I think sometimes my body is like, and I'm sore. And I thought, wait a second, we just had eight or nine hours of rest on this mattress, which was nice. And, and we were properly hydrated and, you know, within an hour, a half hour. So everything's fine, but gosh, that first half hour sometimes is frustrating. And it just kind of drives me crazy. Cause I think what else can I be doing? Cause logically you'd think the body would be in its best shape after a whole eight or nine, eight or nine hours of rest. Any thoughts? But yes, thought, thoughts are the thing that can manifest in the body as stiffness, as mm. hardness. So it's wow. where, where we might be in judgment of how something did or didn't go um, during our day. You know, that, that's really what comes to mind. Wow. And if you are doing all those things, so if you think of somebody who's really active and they're moving a lot, but maybe they don't allow themselves downtime or restoration time, maybe they get great sleep, but there's, it's this constant like go, 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 and there's not space it comes back to that spaciousness piece. The body is going to hold things. So it's like, where are we allowing ourselves to release in our day? Do we have that space to do that? Yeah, um, that's a good point too. Are we breathing? Like our breath is such a huge thing in, you know, creating a little more flexibility within the so mind and body. That's, that's, sorry, that's such a good point because 
it's uh, what do you call it? involuntary? I guess that you breathe because you got to. It's like the heart that you have to tell the heart to beat. It does its thing, but breath we just take for granted. It just goes in and out. And we never pay attention. And then, as I said, when I did those deep breathing exercises and watched the heartbeat go down twenty beats per minute or whatever, it's just you see how powerful it is and so forth. But one of the things and I may have said this to you recently, but I would love to hear your answer on the podcast is. I've struggled with this question my entire life about I don't see why people don't take better care of themselves. It's just has never made sense to me. You've got two nice lungs and yet people smoke and do dope and cigarettes and put all this smoke in their lungs or you got these kidneys and liver that's filtering out bad toxins and things like this and we put all this alcohol in there and the poor liver gets fried at some point. But from the Ashley DePaulis viewpoint of being somebody who's really been about the body, starting, let's face it, back in third grade, when you said, why don't you come home with me? We'll walk, some, we'll run some stairs, we'll do a few things and so forth. I can help you. Although you said she didn't invite you back, which was interesting. But what's what's kind of the, the Ashley viewpoint on, we have an obesity epidemic in our, our world and so forth. What's sort of your take from your vantage point, which to me is very powerful, of why people don't take better care of themselves? Mm. There's many different ways. So it's complex and it's simple at the same time. So it's complex in that our society or our healthcare system doesn't really incentivize taking care of yourself. Mm. It's all built around taking care of you when you're sick (laughs) and when you have extreme issues. There's not a ton of talk around, like we all know that exercise and eating well and not smoking is the healthy thing to do. But then also we are, we all experience trauma, whether it's through a big event or whether it's through, you know, the death of a loved one, that's a trauma. Moving is a highly stressful event. And if we don't take care of ourselves in that process, like you, you can care, you carry things with you basically which shows up in the story that we tell ourselves. And and so I'll put that under our conditioning, the conditioning that we are raised with, and then the societal conditioning of our relationships, our work experiences, so on and so forth, that all play a role in this. So the answers are simple, but taking the actions depending on how much you're carrying, how much baggage you're carrying makes it a lot harder. And smoking and eating and dope and whatever else are mechanisms that we use to cope. So that's how we dull the pain. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Instead of like facing it and, okay, how can I actively release this? And that's through yes, movement and nutrition, but it's also through these other modalities that insurance doesn't cover always that you have to put more time and effort into, you know, it's, it's not sexy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, people, we very much live in a gratification, quick fix mentality. Yeah. And that's, it's, that's right up my alley when it comes to talking about gratitude, where I tell people that a gratitude practice and practicing gratitude and a gratitude journal and writing what you're grateful for five or 10 minutes every day, et cetera, et cetera, is a healthy coping mechanism. And as I always say, you listed a bunch of them, but in a world where the, these coping mechanisms that people are using to self-soothe uh, are deadly and destructive and, and, and kill people. And I know I lost my wife to a prescription pill overdose. And, and that's another one that people take and they get hooked on those things and so forth. But it's a great point about the healthcare system doesn't incentivize us to taking care of ourselves because in the corporate world, which I spent a lot of my life in, I thought it was interesting. There'd be a company I'd work for, I won't mention a name, but it would have like, you had 21 sick days a year allowed. And so the average person would take 19 to 20 sick days every year. So just right up to the, the uh, line. And then another company I worked for, quite progressive, had for every 15 days a year or something like that, if you didn't take a sick day, you got two days of pay. So then nobody got sick because they'd get two days instead of it. So there was nobody who was sick. And I just thought, gosh, what a great example. We all do need incentives, let's face it and stuff. So, but it's interesting. And, and going back to that third grade situation you had with that girl, and then she didn't invite you back. 
uh, I always think it's, it's something I've said in coaching people is that uh, I'll be your training wheels, but I'm not going to pedal your bike. I mean, the person has to do something. We can't do it all for you. And I, uh, for those people, I happen to be a, a, a person of faith and I believe that God gives you the toolbox, but you have to build the house. You know, I, I don't think you just to snap your fingers and the house just appears. And so there's got to be an effort. But what's so interesting about that in the long run, when we look at our mindset, is that when you do accomplish it yourself, the picture you have for yourself and your mindset is so incredibly positive because of what you've accomplished that I know people that have lost a great deal of weight. The biggest, the first thing they say is, why did I wait so long? Because they feel so great and have that great sense of accomplishment, accomplishment and things. But, but one thing, we'll, we'll wrap up about five minutes, but I, I want to ask you this, Ashley, because I think this is something that I take a lot of pride in, but I'd like to get your take on, and that is what I call the daily power hour. Every day of my, of my week, you know, every seven days a week, whatever, I start out with this hour. And I have all these things that I do before I even crack a computer, or turn on my cell phone, uh, look at a screen or anything. But what's kind of, again, from your very healthy perspective, what's kind of your, I don't know, daily checklist of what somebody say, Ashley, I want to be in great, you're in great shape and you advocate for all these things to be healthy. What would be the things on your list? You'd say, well, here's the things I'd like to see that you could do every day that will keep you on a very healthy track. Yes. Well, with what you were just sharing, social connections come up very strongly because our social connections are what either lifts us into health and positivity or not. Mm -hmm. And so looking at who you're surrounded by, and that includes, you know, where you're going to work, how you're spending your day, you know, is that the environment that you really want to be in? And I know there's choice involved in that and sometimes feeling like we don't have a choice, but noticing your social connections and are those social connections, people that are doing the things that you want to be doing, right. you know, if you're, you brought up weight loss, you know, are you hanging out with people that are always going out to eat at unhealthy places, or are you hanging out with people that are active and eat healthy? So that's an example of just making sure your surroundings support what it is that you want in your life. And then in terms of, you know, just daily making sure you get outside. I think that's one really easy one that everyone has access to. It's not necessarily about a gym. It's not about how much time you're putting in. It's are you getting outside your face in the sun? I know that's a little harder in winter, but uh, breathing fresh air, <laughs> all these things are important. It helps with your sleep cycle. Sleep is like king. <laughs> and people I know when they're stressed uh, tend to like, oh, I'll, I'll get to that later. I'll make up my sleep. Well, you're never really making it up. If you actually want to be at your best, then right. prioritizing. Mm -hmm. um, those things. So prioritizing yourself, mm -hmm. I think is the huge thing. It's valuing yourself enough to prioritize the things that support you in being your best. Those are excellent tips. And I know on mine, it, um, I call it the power hour. And I started with the, you know, get up, and make my bed. That's one of the things I said about the army is why the beds are all so perfect is in the first five minutes, they've already accomplished something and their bed is perfectly made with the square corners and all that kind of thing. And, and so, but for me, it's, it's the getting up and making the bed and getting in the shower, shaving, getting ready to go, having my vitamins, having my, my V8 juice, making my lattes, writing my gratitude journal for five or 10 minutes. Yeah. And then lots of water. And I have my first, I always have a big, what is that? A 20 ounce glass of water. Cause you're dehydrated from a whole night of sleep. Mm -hmm. And then five or 10 minutes in the gratitude journal and the 15 minute guided meditation. And then a, maybe a 10 minute stretch. And then I come in here and turn on the computer, but all that's been set up for success for that day. And I only started doing this consistently, not that long ago, but I just realized how many times we've all caught it, caught it with these devices, whether it's your laptop or computer, or especially phones, and on my phone, oh, there's a text. Well, let me just answer that text. And the next thing, now you're doing another text and you see this and you see an email and you've forgotten about yourself. And that's why I love prioritizing yourself, which I think is really, really, really cool. Uh, so that's so important. So such good advice. So one thing I want to make sure I touch on before we wrap up, how can people reach Ashley DePaulis? Mm, 
I can be reached on LinkedIn. That's the place I hang out the most. I also hang out on Instagram, which is ashley.depaulis is my handle. So everything's under my name. And I'm going to be launching this month a community platform Mm -hmm. in Mighty Networks called Recess in the Club. So people can come take short recess breaks with me Mm -hmm. during the day. Brain and body recess breaks. So they're not Mm -hmm. carrying loads of stress around with them. Brain and body breaks? Yes. I like that. That's really cool. And how can they find out about that? Is that on LinkedIn? I will share a link with you. It's through, I'm doing it on a platform called Mighty Networks. Oh, okay. and yeah. I'm still, it's set up, but I'm still like creating a welcome video and all of that. Um, but there is a link to it to join and it's free to join. So excellent. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. And I'll make sure I put that in the show notes too. So just as I suspected, you've been an excellent guest, very informative, very knowledgeable. No, no big surprise to the gratitude guy. My last question is always the same. And at the tender young age that you are at now, what do you know now that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you? And you get to pick one thing. I think I knew this at 18, but then I forgot. We're always like remembering and forgetting and remembering and forgetting. And the big thing is just be yourself and not worry so much about how you're saying what it is you're saying (laughs) and sharing what it is you're sharing just bring your lovely personality and don't worry about the rest and i think when i think about be yourself that's a great comment and i think about words like authentic and transparent and honest and uh it's just so important as you know, you and I both are connected through our LinkedIn and I do a lot of posts and I've, I've actually read a couple of posts of people that I said, well, let me read this post I'm going to put out tomorrow. So I used to do a couple of weeks, sometimes three, but usually two. And a couple of people, just different friends of mine, it was interesting. I would never say what you said about yourself. Like some of the things I struggled with or something, I wouldn't want anybody to know. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, that's fine. I said, that works for you. I said, I'll tell you for me, I want them to know I've been down these roads so I can understand. And we can't walk in each other's shoes, but we can walk a parallel path. Mm -hmm. And when somebody's gone down something, I especially find this with my gratitude work and how much it's all the health reasons from, you know, less when you practice gratitude and less doctor visits and pains and aches and all sorts of things, because you're programming your mind to be positive as opposed to negative. But I love being transparent and it never embarrasses me. I'm just another person doing his best to get through the world. But if I'm up on stages and telling people how this works and there's these big audiences, I think it's more powerful than they, wow, look at the roads he's walked down. He can relate to me. And that's going to mean his message is more powerful. So, but that be yourself is so important. And what's the line everybody else has taken, you know, so just, Mm -hmm. just be yourself too. So Well, thank you, Ashley. Very much appreciate that. I appreciate you being on the show as always. And let me wrap up by saying to the folks again, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating. If you do like what you hear, it's always appreciated. And my gratitude coaching program I have is something that a lot of people take advantage of. And it's, it's somebody that can help you to believe in yourself as you uh, kind of figure out anything in your, li- in your mind that you can conceive of. I can help you achieve that. The support you receive is unmatched and getting you to believe in you and the changes you've been wanting to make or needing to make in your life. Whether it's finances, relationships, your career, your life's journey that you want to change. And this is a great program. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, very important, along with an attitude of gratitude, all combined to ensure your personal success. And for the people that come on board to the gratitude coaching program, my six-month program, the people that get to me through the podcast get two free additional months of coaching. Mm. For more information, you can reach me on my gratitude guy, that gratitude guy website, as I mentioned, and also the email david at thatgratitudeguy.com. 
Also, one more thing, for those of you who would like to receive my Monday morning minute, I send out a video every Monday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you'd like to get that, it's 60 seconds of gratitude to start your week off on the right note. Just go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And in the message box, put in gratitude guy, all one word, and that'll prompt you to get signed up for my Monday morning minute. So thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, I always leave you with the same thing. Remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.